Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon and good evening for people joining us from different locations. Uh, my name is Carolina Cardona. I am an assistant scientist at Johns Hopkins University in the Department of Population, Family and Reproductive Health. And today I'm gonna to be the moderator for today's webinar that is looking at the population age structure changes in Sub-Saharan Africa. This webinar is part of the Demographic Dividend Luminary Series that is being hosted by the Bates Institute at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, just so that we start all in the same page, we define a demographic dividend as the accelerated economic growth that can occur as a result of changes in the population age structure, given that its strategic investments in health, education, uh, economic policy and governance take place. Today, we have the great pleasure of having three great speakers, Dr. Priscilla Dale, Dr. Apurva Jarab, and Dr. Alan Kavageni. Um, so let me just start by sharing that today we're gonna be offering uh, interpretation from English to French. So you can choose your preferred option on your Zoom account. Uh, this is a screenshot of how the Zoom would look like on your end. <clears throat> and if you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see a bottom that has like a globe and it says interpretation. You can click on it and then you'll be able to choose your preferred audio, which it can be either English or French. Let me now introduce the, our esteemed panelists that we have the great pleasure of having today. Uh, we have Dr. Priscilla Idell. She is the chief of the population and development branch at the United Nations Population Fund. Uh, she's going to be interviewed by Dr. Alan Cavageni, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of Population Studies, the School of Statistics and Planning at the College of Business and Management Sciences at Macquarie University. And finally, we're gonna to listen to some closing remarks uh, with, from Dr. Apurva Jada, who is a senior demographer and statistician at the Bureau for Global Health, the Office of Population and Reproductive Health at the Policy and Evaluation and Communication Division at the US Agency for International Development. So without further ado, let me hand it over to Dr. Alan Cabageni, who's gonna be starting uh, the interview with Dr. Priscilla Idell. Alan, the floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you very much, Carolina. I hope our audience, everyone is listening in. Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening from wherever you are. I thank you so much, and especially I want to thank Priscilla um, Idele for having accepted to be part of this. And I want to start off by asking the first question um, to you, Priscilla. What are the key trends in population dynamics and age structure, um, especially for the African continent? Thank, thank you. Thank you. You can hear me. Thank you, Alan, and thank you, Carolina, um, for this very interesting topic of the day. And um, and I think we all know the importance of uh, population issues. So before going to Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, allow me just to say a few points about the world population. We know that the world population clocked eight billion in 2022 and it's projected to continue to grow by another 2 billion and peak at about 10.4 billion in about 60 years. So, however, we also should note that global trend masks notable differences between world regions, as you can see on that chart. There is a growing number of countries where fertility levels are at or below replacement level, and that have slow, no, or negative population growth. And about two thirds of the world population lives in countries that have a total fertility rate at or below 2.1, which is considered the replacement level of uh, fertility. So Africa, <clears throat> as you can see on that chart, is the continent with the largest projected population growth. Out of the next billion people that will be added to the world population, more than half will be African. And between 2022 and 2050, the population of Sub-Saharan Africa is expected to almost double, surpassing 2 billion inhabitants by the late 2040s. Beyond 2060, Africa is the only world region which will continue to grow. As you can see, the line continue to go up. So 
most African con countries continue to have high fertility and thus a very young population. Even though fertility has declined in sub-Saharan Africa over the last three decades, it continues to remain well above four children per woman. And as a result, there has been little change in the age distribution between 1994 and today. That is the, the first two charts uh, on that slide, as you can see. Children, therefore, continue to represent the largest demographic group with half of the population below age 18. This also means that in most sub-Saharan African countries, the cohort of pupils in primary and secondary school age is growing at a much faster pace than in the rich countries where the cohort of pupils in primary and secondary school age is falling. This makes development goals of achieving universal primary and secondary education a much harder challenge. The current age uh, distribution also implies that the demographic dependency burden remains high at almost 80 dependents per 100 working age uh, adults. That is almost, you know, half half. And that's not a good if we don't have enough people uh, to do work. So rapid, uh, a rapid decline in dependency ratio is a precondition for benefiting uh, from a demographic dividend. Sub-Saharan Africa, will enter a favorable demographic window of opportunity around mid-century, that's what the estimates uh, tell, when almost two thirds of the population will be in the labor force. So this is based on projects, uh, projections that assume that fertility will continue to decline at the current pace. And should fertility decline faster, thanks to higher investments in family planning, the demographic transition could then accelerate. However, at the same time, we must recognize that the population of many African countries will also be rapidly aging, even as the total share of the older persons in the total population of most African countries remains low in comparison with the rest of the world. Therefore, that means it's important for African countries to pay increasing attention to population aging so they can also prepare well ahead of time and not wait uh, for the, the rest of it to happen and then start reacting. Alan? Awesome. Um, thank you very much uh, for kickstarting us and uh, taking us through. And you emphasize the need for populations in Africa to be cognizant of the increasing and pay increasing or rather attention to the population that is aging. Um, again, we also have heard from you talking about the declines, uh, projected declines in fertility as we focus and we talk about uh, harnessing issues to do with the uh, demographic dividend. The other question we'd like to find out from you, um, how can we take advantage of a youthful age structure to achieve a demographic dividend? Thank you, Alan. Again, a very important question. Um, the conditions for a demographic dividend are created by the demographic transition when the dependency ratios of countries are falling. Just as I mentioned earlier, if we have a large working population, then we can benefit from that um, age structure. So it's not enough, however, that more and more people enter into the working age. If they enter into the working age without the work to do, then what do we do with them? So that means that it's essential that they are healthy, they are educated, and they have the right skills to find productive and decent employment. So those all have to go in tandem together. Hence, the realization of the demographic dividend is not an automatic process and it requires a deliberate and well-targeted policies. While we have examples of countries that have successfully realized a demographic dividend, we must recognize that there are also countries that have failed to do so. So <clears throat> harnessing the demographic dividend will thus require higher investments, not just uh, in reducing family sizes or in family planning, but also in health and in education, because a healthy nation is a wealthy nation. These investments in human capital 
which help to address supply side constraints to labor markets, as I've mentioned, must be complemented by investments in the real economy, which address demand side issue of labor markets. Uh, we also must note that the conditions that need to be in place for a country to achieve the demographic dividend can also be illustrated from the perspective of a life course of an adolescent girl, for example. If I take my own experience when I was growing up, what really propelled me to the levels of achievement that I have today is the, my own you know, um, support from the family, especially uh, my father and my mother who valued education a lot. So as an adolescent girl growing then, I had the privilege of that support, which was not a common thing in the, you know, in the years that I was growing up, you know, 50 to 60 years ago, you can guess my age now. So to date, too many girls become teenage mothers and too many are married off to become child brides. Too many are therefore unable to complete the education, participate in the economy, earn an independent income and pursue their dreams. They become dependent on their partners or susceptible to violence and abuse, and they effectively live a life of diminished expectations. So what I'm getting at is that human capital development must fundamentally begin with the mother-to-be, which also affects the cognitive development of newborns and hence <clears throat> the, the children as they grow up and finally the mothers. Human capital development critically depends on the sexual and reproductive health and rights as well. Access to sexual and reproductive health services contributes to overall health and well-being. So a healthy individual will be better positioned to participate actively in education, in work, and in other aspects of life. So sexual and productive health and rights are closely linked to gender equality when individuals, irrespective of gender, have control over their reproductive choices. It promotes equality in relationships, in education, and in the workforce. So for me, human capital development depends on deliberate efforts to educate and empower young people, and in particular girls and women. It's only through a life course policy approach and a lifelong investments that the benefits of a demographic dividend can be fully achieved. Alan? Thank you, Priscilla. It seems that Alan's connection might be a bit unstable. Um, so I'm just going to have to step in to ask you the, the following question. Um, as a follow-up, should we be concerned about a youth vulture in the face of potential economic crisis, governance and politics, and climate change, which is a, a very hot topic when we think about population dynamics? Uh, definitely, Carolina. <laughs> Let me start by stating that um, for every, you know, uh, issue, concern or a challenge, if we look at it on the flip side, it usually opens an opportunity that can be tapped into. There are, of course, associated concerns with the youth bulge. If uh, the African continent doesn't prepare well in advance and this preparation will mean that they have to anticipate certain situations, they have to take preventative uh, measures, uh, if at all they are anticipated, and they have to have proper response planning mechanisms in place, and essentially being prepared for all eventualities. The prospect for sub-Saharan African countries in harnessing the demographic dividend depends <clears throat> on how best they solve um, those concerns or challenges in the key areas that have the potential to cultivate the dividends. So for example, one area, one key area is education and skills development. This could be hampered by inadequacy of education infrastructure, a large deficit in the number of teachers needed to achieve universal education by 2030 and many other factors. And it results in poor learning out outcomes. Um, as we know, an estimated nine in 10 children in the region of Africa are unable to read a basic text by the age of 10. And this was, and this was worsened by the COVID uh, pandemic. 
There are also concerns around health and well-being concerns. And I mentioned earlier that a healthy nation is a wealthy one. So despite progress in health systems strengthening in sub-Saharan Africa, um, um, the region continues to have the highest child mortality in the world, estimated at about 72 deaths among under fives per 1,000 live births, almost double the world average. A 15-year-old girl in sub-Saharan Africa faces the highest risk of unwanted pregnancy and the highest <clears throat> lifetime risk of dying from maternal causes, estimated at about 1 in 40. Harmful practices are continue in abandon, such as female gentle mutilation and child marriage. Those are also prevalent and perpetuate gender inequalities. Um, not forgetting employment <clears throat> and decent jobs also remain of concern. Economies in most of Saharan Africa are dominated by the informal sector and well over half of the young people that enter the labor market will not be able to find a productive job in the formal economy, but will end up in precarious, unstable, and unproductive jobs in the informal economy. And that's the reason why many countries in the region grapple with high levels of working poverty, even though they are working, but because they are not in stable and productive, uh, decent jobs. So, but we also know there are other threats to the demographic dividend because it needs investment. And many countries today, the poorest countries, have very high debt burdens and increasingly unsustainable debt levels. Many of them will need either debt relief or a face default. Without adequate debt relief, there's a real and present danger that the countries will need to undergo significant um, fiscal austerities that will definitely undermine social and economic development and could spell a prolonged economic downturn. Lastly, we have a continent that is faced with a lot of climate crisis and conflict. And these <clears throat> repeated issues of food crisis add up almost to a sequence of almost uh, permanent food insecurity, uh, challenging all the development efforts in place. Repeated climate um, um, occurrences, as we know, disasters have also really put back uh, a lot of countries in the continent. Several African countries uh, confront notable political instability as well. So when you combine in political instability, um, uh, a combination of conflict and climate crisis, this cause a massive um, you know, disruption in many people's lives, including population displacement, with more than 30 million uh, people forcibly displaced in sub-Saharan Africa, the largest number in the East and the Horn of Africa. So in very simple and clear terms, we are experience, uh, experiencing a, a situation today which bears the greatest risk of reversing developmental progress that we have seen in many of the poorest countries uh, in the continent. And if we don't manage the situation well, then um, what we shall end up with is just worsening our uh, poverty, inequalities, um, rising um, natural and man-made disaster, uh, disasters, uh, food insecurity, and uh, a lot more you know, um, uh, mass uh, migration out of uh, situations that are volatile. But it's not all doom and gloom. I don't want to end on that because uh, as I said earlier, every a challenge brings an opportunity. And we have an opportunity in sub-Saharan Africa that's very real, that we need uh, uh, to use to reap the demographic dividend. We, I believe that the potential of African youth uh, to play a pivotal role in lifting their countries out of poverty or elevating them to the next level on the path of sustainable development and wealth is well there. And this is probably no news <clears throat> to those watching uh, this webinar. But in order for us to achieve its absolute must, then the governments have to create conditions in which everybody has access to health, education, and decent work. And of course, peace and security. Uh, because I think young people is where we need to place our faith in and to have the opportunity <clears throat> to give them the opportunity to freely decide whether and when to marry and start a family. 
And I think events like this, like this webinar are really critical for raising those issues. So when we speak of challenges, we should always flip the coin and speak about opportunities as well. I don't want to forget the digital divide that's a reality too, that we have to continue to address. And that makes me very optimistic, acknowledging what is happening currently in sub-Saharan African youth who are excelling in adopting new technologies to fulfill their potential. And that's really an area that governments need to place a lot of emphasis in getting the infrastructure within the region. Thank you very much uh, for taking us through all this. I want to encourage and also remind our participants online, please send and submit your questions. Uh, they'll be responded to at the end of this webinar. Um, one last question, Priscilla. Would like to find mm -hmm. out from you, what are the data or program innovations at UNFPA that is supporting or the different efforts to harness the demographic dividend um, in Africa? Thank you. I was hoping that you will ask that, Alan. <laughs> um, as you know, at UNFPA, we are all about data and innovation. We organize our work around three pillars. And please bear with me uh, uh, so that I can take you through some of our most important work. Um, the, the first pillar of our work uh, really bears upon generating quality timely information to inform all that we do. So because in UNFPA, we count everyone, we try to, because we strongly believe that everyone counts. So UNFPA provides technical leadership and innovation uh, in the implementation and use of modernized and geospatially coded national censuses, civil registration and vital statistics systems, including households and other administrative systems uh, systems data, such as health uh, management information systems. Um, and all of these, we have managed to implement specific uh, innovations uh, uh, in the use of artificial intelligence, uh, modern technology uh, to facilitate generation and quick analytic, uh, analytics of the data that are collected. UNFPA also supports the generation of common operational data sets on population statistics for humanitarian preparedness and response. And it's considered one of the most downloaded um, uh, data sets according to the humanitarian uh, data exchange in which these data are housed. We also strengthen data availability and analysis uh, to drive and direct more impactful investments in sustainable development and crisis action. In so doing, um, UNFPA fulfills the shared vision of unlocking the data dividend for the achievement of the SDGs. So we talked about the demographic dividend, but we also have the data dividend. Our second pillar of work is now taking the data into more useful, uh, useful form. So while we count everyone, and that is important, we make sure that those numbers are translated into action through programs or policies. So at UNFPA, we continue to develop, update, and optimize systems of data analysis, data use, and dissemination <clears throat> globally, counting on innovation, the technical know-how, but also paying attention to the highest standards of data privacy. So UNFPA's flagship population data portal offers a cost-effective way to disseminate georeference and disaggregated census data as well as population data from surveys and a wide range of other sources. For example, data on legislative uh, support for sexual and reproductive health and, um, uh, uh, and rights and actual decision-making power give a clear view on women's real ability to self-determination and access to sexual and reproductive health services. We have climate change and uh, flood risk data that we combine with up-to-date population numbers and locations that allow UNFPA to track people living under threat of flood risk and enable climate change preparedness and resilience. We also engage a lot in geospatial analysis and mapping of access and use of services, as well as infrastructure that makes us identify locations and populations 
in need and those farthest behind, thus fulfilling the promise of the 2030 agenda of leave no one behind. Our third and last pillar is on making sure that population policies safeguard individual rights and choices, especially for women. And this is critically important in a demographically diverse world, as I mentioned earlier. UNFPA builds on our unique convener role and continues to guide governments with developing rights-based population policies that safeguard individual rights by assisting with analysis of national and regional demographic landscapes and also uh, assisting in the uh, analysis of the impact of global megatrends and realities such as climate change, um, urbanization, migration, technology, and um, uh, many more. We support countries to integrate demographic data and intelligence into national development plans, policies, and programs. And UNFPA supports governments in both high and low fertility contexts in taking concrete human-centered action that allows countries to benefit from that uh, demographic um, uh, uh, reality and reap the demographic dividend or build demographic resilience. So notwithstanding all the work that we do, under each pillar is accompanied by robust capacity strengthening activities of local and national institutions. That makes countries take ownership of their data and they can also effectively collect, process and use disaggregated data to carry out the demographic and foresight based policy analysis as I've described. So uh, lastly, UNFPA supports global dialogues and positioning of key development topics of the ICPD program of action and also the SDGs to ensure they remain front and center of global and national uh, development agendas and in planning and decision making. Uh, we also do a lot of innovative work on solid and sustainable uh, footing um, um, that, uh, that has been established through our innovation fund. Uh, through our innovation fund, um, UNFPA um, uses the newest technology and also um, uh, uh, brilliant ideas out of the box to do amazing things. For example, um, this fund is very much active in sub-Saharan Africa with mobile uh, sexual and productive health clinics in Namibia and also in, uh, in DRC where women can find midwives through an app. So those are some examples. So to make sure that we are grounded in our work, we've also set up um, what we call um, a, a population, um, a data and population policy thematic uh, fund. Through the fund, we give donors the opportunity to partner with us uh, to unlock the data dividend for sustainable future for the people and planet. Over 80% of the funds are targeted to go to countries di directly. And, um, and of course, uh, you can also you know, reach out uh, to me uh, to learn more about the, the fund if we, you, you're interested in working together. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Priscilla, for walking us through all this. You've introduced something very interesting, talking about the data dividend as we talk about the demographic dividend. And a number of issues you have raised, you've talked about even issues to do with migration and technology and the support that you give to different countries with regard to the national uh, development plans. Uh, thank you for walking us through the three pillars at, uh, from UNFPA perspective. And again, uh, letting the world know right about now the data dividend funds that countries um, can reach out to you. Um, right about now, I hope there are more questions that are coming through. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Apova. Uh, Apova, she has already been introduced, but I'll say just briefly that she's the senior demographer and statistician at the Bureau of the Global Health Office of Population and Reproductive Health Policy Evaluation and Communication Division at uh, USAID. She's going to be uh, discussing, having listened in to what Priscilla has been uh, taking us through. And we're happy to hear from you, your vision, or can talk about uh, the youth quake and migration. Welcome, Dr. Apova. 
Thank you so much, Alan and Carolina, for organizing this. Um, and Priscilla, thank you for the really illuminating um, talk that you just had. It was a really lovely, informal conversation between you both. And um, I really appreciated your personal story, connection to SRHR and the demographic dividend. Um, that was really wonderful. And I really appreciated how you ended with talking about a lot of the data innovations that are taking place at UNFPA in order to support and harness the demographic dividend. I think the point of um, not just counting people, but making people count is um, really well understood um, in the work that UNFP is doing. And USAID is really proud to partner on uh, some of that work with our work with the interagency agreement with the US Census Bureau, or even with the demographic and health surveys. So um, thank you for those really, really uh, robust thoughts. Uh, next slide, please. Since um, Youthquake is the word for today, um, not just an excellent book by Edward Pace, but also describing this really nuanced sentiment attached to population change, which is that of you know, significant cultural, political, or social change arising from the actions um, or influence of young people. I wanted to highlight some coverage um, that some of us in the United States have been seeing in the New York Times from the last few months on this phenomenon. The stories are not your usual warnings of disaster or doom only as it relates to um, the population trends in Africa, but um, really nuanced and maybe even joyous ones that are describing cultural and musical renaissance, entrepreneurial drive, um, migration, uh, which we'll get to in a bit, um, including the dilemmas of who, who gets to move, but who gets to remain as well. And I think these are really searing examples of the youth potential that we talk so much about. And it's refreshing to have that nuance in mainstream um, Western media coverage. Um, so I wanted to put that out there because it's um, this is a conversation that's happening, not just in our circles, but certainly um, outside as well. Next slide, please. So within our circles, we do spend a great deal of time talking about population age structures that will change in the next quarter century. Uh, but what we don't talk about enough is the way that it'll not just transform many African countries, but also radically reshape their relationship with the rest of the world. And so I've taken this team, theme of youth quake really to heart because I want to highlight some takeaways for me from the book. And I'll get to uh, some of the migration pieces in a second. But it really... Um, underscores a lot of the larger trends that Priscilla was talking about, about school enrollment, about employment and the like. So by 2030, the number of primary school children in African countries will expand by a third to 250 million. If you think about the sheer magnitude of investments that need to take place, just not just to keep pace with that, but also to continue to expand um, and innovate um, are really mind boggling. And so, you know, under the African Union 2063 agenda, Universal secondary education and primary education is a goal. However, the funding shortfall for education across the continent is estimated to be at about 40 billion until 2030. This goes back to the point Priscilla was making about the steep human capital investment uh, that's that needs to be made. Um, so I wanted to highlight that here. <clears throat> if you look at the employment figures, you know, each year more than 25 million young Africans will reach the age of 15 and be defined as working age. And that by 2050, the working age population will have more than doubled um, from its current size to about 1.5 billion, uh, which is, again, something that Priscilla mentioned. And so you think about the sustained job creation that's needed with a focus on sectors of employment with good, stable working conditions, benefits and more is really, really quite substantial. Next slide, please. So let's take a closer look then at education and, and next employment. I want to focus on the middle piece here, um, which is that of investment. When it comes to investment among the countries that the book has highlighted as kind of the 12 focal countries, it, it looks like Nigeria spends the least on education, about 7% of their recent federal budget, uh, despite having the continent's largest economy. Uganda is in the middle of the spectrum, having budgeted about 9% of its total expenditure for education. And then Burundi, Tanzania, and Burkina Faso are the continental leaders that allocate about 20% or more of their budgets to education. So I'm, I'm looking at some of the Q&A that's coming in is what do we need to have in place? What, how do we implement some of it? And I think the funding shortfall piece is really, really huge. 
And um, I like the point that Priscilla, you were making about debt relief and other things that may be needed in order to really be able to focus then on building up some of these infrastructure that need to take place in order to be even close to reaping um, a possible demographic dividend. Next slide, please. And I'll end with this experience, uh, example that's in the book about underemployment. And um, the, the example is given of Nigeria. Um, between 2014 to 2018, apparent, almost 20 million young Nigerians sought to join the workforce, but a fraction of those jobs were actually created. And so by the end of that year, the number of Nigerians actively looking for work had quadrupled over five years to 21 million which was an official employment unemployment rate of about 23%. But the point about um, underemployment is really huge, and this example really stood out to me. Among Nigerians with post-secondary school education, the rate had almost tripled to 30%. In short, meaning that an educated Nigerian was more likely to be unemployed than Nigerians in general. Now, this then leads to conversations about um, migration, uh, and and what that means then back to the country and, and conversations about brain drain. And that's why I wanted to take some of these examples of what's happening and think then a little bit um, about what it means for um, some of the under kind of understudied aspects of what could go into harnessing the demographic dividend. Next slide, please. And that's where nuance comes in. I think demographers are really adept at unearthing nuance. Um, recent syntheses on demographic changes in Africa all agree that the diversity and the pace and intensity of demographic phenomenon is so different from country to one country to next. Even within a country, you can have seven different countries. And so efforts like the Demographic Dividend Effort Index, uh, the NTA analyses, et cetera, parsed out country by country is so unearth, uh, so integral in unearthing um, this nuance. And, and some of the slides that I showed demonstrate how our understanding of some of these nuances really is. But then, you know, I think nuance is kind of missing from policy. Policy tends to be broad brush strokes rather than really honing in on more local actions in order to make local changes. And so I think even a lot of these conversations on the demographic dividend tend to focus on those national regional trends um, uh, and focus less on the demographic div diversity that Priscilla spoke so eloquently about. And, you know, academia are, is so rife about what we should be doing, but it's sometimes in these superficial policy statements that are hidden in a hasty conclusion. So clearly that's something that we as policymakers need to focus on and work on um, uh, so that it's it's we can translate all of what we know into projects, planning and implementation um, going forward. Next slide, please. And so with that, I want to come to an aspect of the youth quake that I want to talk about, which is migration. And I really do wonder, uh, Priscilla, you mentioned a little bit about migration. Alan, you did too. So throwing this also back to you all and the audience about um, the thoughts about migration fitting into the demographic dividend, you know, especially given what we've just discussed on education and employment challenges to harnessing the demographic dividend caused by the youth quake. It's important to look at the inevitable role that migration will play potentially in shaping the DD in the future, understanding that right now when we look at migration, net migration is kind of zero and at the global level. And but but looking again country to country with that nuanced perspective, it's a different story. Next slide, please. Thank you. From a from a bird's eye perspective, the number of international migrants um, in a most recent kind of report was about 281 million globally in 2020, with nearly two thirds being labor migrants. And this figure, of course, remains a very small drop in the bucket of the world's total population. It's actually just about 3.6%, which means that most people will remain in the country that they were born. However, when you look at the country level perspective, which we'll get to in a second, it is meaningful. And of course, there's many different types of migrants, you know, labor, short term, irregular, uh, refugees, internally displaced persons, et cetera. So their trajectories are different as well as their impacts on development um, will be different. Um, there's also, of course, a lot of internal migration um, that, that sometimes, you know, is masked under urbanization that's happening. And I'm not showing you figures here in the interest of time, but it's also a very, very important aspect. Next slide, please. So the 2023 World Development Report from the World Bank, I think, is essential reading as a primer to 
thinking about the patterns and nuances of migration worldwide. I've put in two screenshots uh, from the report that stood out to me. On the left, you see a breakdown of migrant types and where they live. And on the right, you see their distinctive kind of match and motive matrix to describe migration push and pull factors, um, as well as some of the policy constraints and policy challenges uh, involved. Match determines the net gains of receiving migrants and motive determines their international protection needs. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So the economies of Nigeria, Egypt, and South Africa um, on the continent account for half of the continent's GDP and more than a quarter of its population. Then if you look at remittance numbers, in 2020, Egypt and Nigeria were part of the top 10 countries receiving remittances, as you can see above. The story is more interesting, of course, if you slice and dice in different ways, and I urge you to look at the report if you're interested in more. Um, essentially, in addition to Egypt and Nigeria, you see Morocco, Ghana, and Kenya as um, the other top five sort of international remittance recipient countries in Africa. And, you know, inflows to Egypt and Nigeria exceeded 15 billion US dollars for each country and accounted for about 56% of their total remittance flows to the region. And there's also figures that look at um, what is the percentage of GDP uh, that remittance contributes to. So do take a look if you're interested. This is all to say that the impact of remittances on GDP and thus on development and harnessing the DD is not negligible, of course, not in every single country, but in a handful of countries. So it begs some thought. And again, how does one think about then the role of diaspora populations in impacting development of the home country? And how would that potentially be tied in to the demographic dividend? Next slide, please. I'll end on this. Uh, again, a call for data, but but more. Migration trends that we've seen are snapshots of today and years past. And given uh, everything that's happening in the world, this is actually something that's hard to predict with humanitarian crises or even climate-related crises. We don't know much about future migration trajectories, only to say that they will likely increase, right? And so anticipating future migration flows encompasses an increasingly diverse field of approaches. We have early warning systems, we have foresight um, and forecasting, which are the main approaches intended to provide informed guesses about future migration flows and trends. And these approaches can provide crucial information for policymakers to anticipate future challenges and adjust policies, design programs, and more importantly, allocate resources. Um, Rather than providing an accurate prediction of future flows, many projects aim to highlight the inher inherent uncertainty um, in future migration and work towards greater preparedness and resilience, actually echoing um, some of what, Priscilla, you were saying about preparing for aging um, by setting up sort of contingency plans or infrastructure for future possibilities. But all these approaches hinge on the underlying data that they'll use, and um, this could include Experts on migration, administrative data, surveys or censuses, CRVS comes in here as well. Um, and predictions in the field of migration uh, appear particularly different given the complexity and diversity of the migration process. So I think given the limited availability and quality of migration data, and given that we're a group of demographers and others gathered here today talking about the demographic dividend, I think it's important for us to also think about what data do we wish we had to understand the linkage between migration and the demographic dividend, and what could we add in, say, a census or a DHS, a mixed survey, a PMA survey, or more? Um, where are we learning nuances about aspirations, motivations, and challenges for migration among the youth? And what could we then act on in order to work towards a demographic dividend in the country of origin? So I urge researchers to do exactly this. Um, there have been really great starts. There's a new analytical framework for augmenting the demographic dividend from formal migration um, named after the international surplus labor circulation model. I think that's fabulous. And it's a great opportunity for further research to inform policy and inform DD discourse, particularly now more than ever as the world prepares this year for the 30th anniversary of the International Conference on Population and Development. Um, so with that, I'd love to um, hear any questions and answers, uh, questions that you all may have. And um, I'd love to hear Priscilla's thoughts on, on some of the points I made, but certainly those that are in the queue um, in the queue for the for the questions. So thank you over to you, I believe Alan and Priscilla. Thank you, Apova 
excellent additions, especially on the issue of migration. We know that that is a teething problem uh, um, and uh, which has been made very political and, um, and creating a lot of anxieties in some of the receiving countries. Um, and uh, which means that there's a need to focus on the global compact on migration, really, what does that mean and how do we operationalize them, that across both receiving and um, sending countries. Thank you very much, Apurva and Priscilla. Your presentations and your discussions were fantastic and very illuminated. I really enjoyed uh, hearing the optimism that you have about the potential economic gains that can come from the Sub-Saharan African region. And it was also very interesting to see the data innovations that UNFPA is leading. And as you both said that we need to count people, but we also need to make them count. And also to Apurva, thank you for showing us and discussing the importance of migration when we think about demographic dividend. Um, so we're now in the portion of the webinar where we're gonna be answering to some of the questions that were posted throughout the webinar. Thank you all the participants that posted so many questions. It was very difficult to pick out of 21 questions because we only have time for two or three questions. So I'm gonna start with the first question from, and probably I'm gonna pronounce your name incorrectly, so please bear with me. It's from what was in Taklisilasi. He's asking how do we explain the impact of high dependency ratios of youth population when we think about the demographic dividend? Um, thank you, Carolina, and thanks, uh, Wont Wilson, for your question as well. And I think um, in the beginning, we heard from Carolina about what the demographic uh, dividend is. Um, so, and I also did touch on the uh, dependence ratio and so on. So <clears throat> the demographic dependence ratio is a proxy for the share of the population that are productive in the economy and the labor market. So as the dependency ratio falls, there is a higher proportion of youth and working age adults relative to children and older people, which means it has a positive impact on the productivity and economic outputs. Of course, we know that this is a simplified uh, characterization of reality as some children and older people, especially in developing country contexts, also contribute to the economy. Uh, you have seen, you know, uh, under 15 year olds working in the farms and so on, and um, earning a living. Uh, of course, that is child labor. But there is <clears throat> ample evidence from several countries showing the positive economic impact of a demographic structure concentrated in the working ages. Many sub-Saharan African countries are still far from opening the demographic window of opportunity with persistent <laughs> high fertility leading to an increasingly young age structure. <laughs> Sorry. So to open the window of, in the first place, individuals and couples need to be empowered to make free and informed choices about the number and spacing of their children and also to fulfill the, that potential. So only then can the demographic uh, dividend become a reality. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Priscilla. Um, the second question that I'm gonna pick from the Q&A box uh, is addressed to both Priscilla and Apurva and to both of, both of them, the question is from Ramesha Shuket asking what are the new policies that are addressed towards reaping the maximum benefits from a demographic dividend? And if you can also share some recent examples of implementation from your experience. So maybe I can start and then sort out this cough. Sorry, I just recovered from uh, the flu and uh, causes also uh, throat irritation. So, in relation to that, Ramesh, there are some good um, practices that can be found in our UNFPA run program, um, what we call the Sahel Women, Women Empowerment and Demographic Dividend Program in West and Central Africa, uh, SWED in short. The SWED is a Sahel Women's Empowerment Program that delivers an integrated approach to human capital development 
and uh, starts from investments in family planning and takes a whole life course approach, um, making sure that we attend to uh, individual needs, not just at a certain point in time, but starting uh, from childhood up to adulthood. So it's very important that investments are sustained because a human being doesn't just appear, you know, uh, when they are an adult. Uh, if we give children a good foundation and give adolescents a good foundation, then they could, that foundation, you know, continues in life and that dividend can be, you know, uh, um, ripped well later in life. We also leverage technology. Online learning, we can do that. Uh, we can do virtual vocational training. Uh, E-commerce has become very popular these days and it became even more prominent during the COVID pandemic. And crowdfunding, all are innovative and um, with entrepreneurial capacity that young people can bring forward. But as we know, there's always a need to prioritize and invest in bringing certain you know, um, elements of the digital divide at the fore. I can come in here too. Um, you know, I think uh, I see that uh, Toshiko and Barbara from Population Reference Bureau are on the line. I think Population Reference Bureau's four dividends um, model is actually really interesting and important to think about this question. Um, I think a lot of times what projects tend to do is fund specific aspects of, say, one health issue to impact one or two health outcomes and the like. And I think more integrated projects like what Priscilla was describing are really, really key. And so at USAID, you know, we have the momentum suite of awards, for example, and then there's uh, there's multiple ones where you're not just focusing on one health outcome, but you're focusing more on a life course approach. Agency for All is another project that does exactly that. So in order to really reap the benefits of the demographic dividend, it does then look at education. It looks at employment. It even some of them look at governance. They look at fragile humanitarian settings for their unique needs when it comes to um, reaping the demographic dividend. Of course, none of it is given, but I think having that frame of thinking about how do we make our work more horizontal rather than continue on these vertical trajectories, we're never going to reap the demographic dividend if that's that's kind of we stay in our lane and think only that way. And I know that many have made that call, you know, like, oh, we should have a ministry of finance and all these other ministries involved in demographic dividend conversations. Absolutely. And I encourage us all to have those conversations again, especially in light of the International Conference on um, Population Development. It's ICPD plus 30 this year. What progress have we really made um, in the last 30 years and, and how are we really thinking about the next 30 years, particularly when it comes to the demographic dividend in terms of the horizontal investments and horizontal project design that we can do? Thank you, Apoorva and Priscilla. And I like your emphasis that, um, and it's also aligned with the definition that we presented on demographic dividend that it is not an automatic um, economic gain. It has to be invested in it and it has to be multidimensional. It's not just the one sector and then the economic gains will come from it. Um, our next question comes from Christopher Lalemba. He's asking that considering that for Africa to achieve this, we need political will. He's indicating that in the region, they're having conflicts and social and economic challenges that contribute to teenage and unwanted pregnancies. What are we doing in terms of engaging governments in the region to address these challenges together, not just on paper, but also in implementation? As a sexual and reproductive health researcher advocate himself, one of the challenges he meets in the red, is, in, is the red carpet, holding meetings from time to time, but no follow-up in addressing these challenges. For the youth who are innovative enough to do business, they need to access to loans. Unfortunately, the interest at the banks are high they cannot even manage to grow their businesses, rather work to pay check, uh, to pay the loan only. Um, so Priscilla and Apurva, we'd love to hear your thoughts about this question, please. Thank you. Um, thanks, Christopher. I think that's an important question. In my previous um, points, I made clear that um, it's only when governments take ownership of some of these things that we can actually reap what we call a dividend. So it goes without saying that that is an important element. 
at UNFPA, we've hosted what we have called <clears throat> 4D dialogues. These are government policy dialogues on demographic diversity and dividends over the last uh, three years, 2020 to 2023. And um, this was, you know, in uh, conjunction with the African Union and the German Foreign Ministry, GIZ, GIZ, and also the Berlin Institute in Germany. So we developed this platform in order to provide exactly this, this space for governments, experts, practitioners, uh, civil society, and young people uh, without the red carpet that you described or mentioned uh, for it to be action-oriented dialogue um, without that flair of politi politics and other things that come with these high-level meetings. So this has been an effective way of sharing experiences and practices and also lessons learned. And um, hundreds of experts and government representatives joined over the three years for, for, uh, of the initial uh, series. Uh, we shall share a link to some of the reports that were developed as a result under your question. And we are currently also in conversation with the African Union and the German government again to discuss how do we now take these dialogues or this series forward to ensure that they are translated um, into concrete actions at the uh, country level. In addition, uh, this year marks the 30th anniversary of uh, the International Conference on Population and Development. And um, in commemoration of that, uh, we are also holding different dialogues, uh, uh, global dialogues on different key issues and, and taking also advantage of key moments uh, of uh, gatherings that are taking place. Again, this will bring um, a mixed constituency of participants in order again to leverage uh, those voices, including of young people uh, and, and, and women as well as civil society. So we hope that, you know, continuous conversation and, um, and bringing to the fore all of these issues will continue to elevate and position them uh, within uh, policy making and national uh, strategic uh, priorities. Uh, UNFPA also provides targeted technical assistance with the partners uh, throughout um, <clears throat> our country program, uh, 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 where our country programs are located. And again, there are many ways in which you know uh, we, we we make sure policy uh, continues to be elevated in most of our uh, convenings. Yeah, I just want to add that um, one of the points that um, is made a lot of times is that there's a lot of entrepreneurial drive that's happening, especially among the youth in Africa. But then another point to that is you can't entrepreneur your way out of bad governance um, or or corrupt governance. And I think that point is um, very valid based on the question that you're asking. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that um, more um, concerted, not just conversations, but actions like what Priscilla was describing are very, very important and strategic to get involved in. Um, and, and the ICPD anniversary is one such forum. Um, I do think that when it comes to um, various tools that we have in order to talk about the demographic dividend governance um, uh, is actually, a, and, and strong institutions are part of that four dividends model. I also think things like the demographic dividend effort index are very agile. Right now we're working on in integrated cl integrating climate, for example, within the DDEI framework, thanks to Carolina in the Philippines um, with the USAID a mission over there. And I think such factors speak to the various other big challenges that um, governments are grappling with. And if we could continue to tie in the DD to some of those bigger priorities, um, that may be a way to advocate for it um, and, and maybe work within the, the governance structures that we do have. Thank you very much, Apurva and Priscilla. Um, as always, your answers were very illuminating and we enjoyed a lot of the presentations that you shared today and the discussions. Um, we're respectful of people's time and we have to finish this webinar. I just want to thank the William Gates Senior Institute for Population and Reproductive Health at Johns Hopkins University and also the International Conference on Family Planning as they allow us to host this series of webinars on demographic dividend luminaries. Uh, please stay tuned for our next webinar that will take place in around three months because this is a quarterly event. 
uh, and you will be able to find a recording of this webinar on our website that will be available for you to download within a week and you will also get an email of uh, folks who register to participate of this event. So without further ado, I just wanna thank our great panelists. Thank you for your illuminating discussions and the points that you've raised uh, when we think about demographic dividend. Thank you all and have a nice rest of your day or evening. Bye everyone. Thank you, bye-bye.